if I cross my legs? Hmm? Hello? It's okay if I cross my legs? My brains don't work. If I don't cross my legs. Jananam Sukadam Maranam Karunam Milanam Maduram Smaranam Karunam Kalevesha Sakalam Karunam Samayadipate Akilam Karunam Good afternoon. Yeah, I said good afternoon to all of you. Yeah, that's better. I thought you're not on talking terms with me already. <laughs> Please. Good evening, dear Christites, respected faculty, revered Father Vice Chancellor, revered Father Pro Vice Chancellor, Registrar, dear members of the Isha Foundation, hearty greetings on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee celebrations of Christ deemed to be university. Investor Inquest, which is organized by the Department of Professional Studies, takes charge of a series of lectures by people of eminence. And today's talk by our dearest Sadhguru is one such. Sadhguru, we deem it our honor and privilege to have you amidst us today. On behalf of all our Christites present here today, a humble gratitude to you for sparing time to us. Without further ado, we would now focus on the question-answer session. There were about 300 questions that came across to be answered by you, Sadhguru. And today's session shall see a few of them being answered. All of us Christites will be represented by myself, Raja, from School of Law, Christ TV University. My name is Pooja N. I am from Department of Professional Studies. Yeah, my, name is, my name is Naina and I am from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. The first question for today, Sadhguru. I, being a law student, give a lot of importance to the rights that I possess, which is basically the fundamental rights, that's what we are talking about here. So I think I should probably be allowed to sleep during classes because that comes under the purview of Article 21, right to life and liberty. But, but, I also have a sense of responsibility that I should stay away and focus on what is thought. So, how do we youth handle the rights and responsibilities? Or if I, say, if I can say, how do we youth balance between rights and responsibilities? If you're uh, that unwell, that you have to sleep during the day, you better be in a hospital, not in a college <laughs> uh, There are rights, of course there are rights. But it is, isn't it your right to become a full-fledged human being? Is it your right? Certainly. And is it, isn't it also your duty to be a full-fledged human being for the people who live around you that you are not a constipated human being? <laughs> Hello? Is it not? So you have rights and responsibilities, they are never separate. It's your right, but if you exercise your right, it should be beneficial to everybody. If your rights are detrimental to everybody, including yourself, and a young man wants to sleep during the day. I don't even sleep during the night most of the time. <laughs> How come you want to sleep during the day? 
this means you want to avoid life. See, there is life and death, all right? When you're young, probably you never thought about it, but you better think about it because before you know what happened, you'll be dead one day. Yes, most people think other people die. <laughs> uh, you know, people open the newspaper and see those obituary columns, oh, these are all d dying kind of people. I am an immortal kind. <laughs> no, no, I am reminding you, you and me will die. Well, in my experience, it feels like I was born day before yesterday, but see, <laughs> in my experience I still feel like it's just a few days ago I was born, but time goes by. So, what you call as life is the dynamic nature of a certain energy that we call as life. When it becomes static, we call it death, yes? Sleep is just like death. Why you're going into sleep is just to bounce back with new vigor of life. Because if you don't go to sleep tonight, tomorrow morning you will become like this. But there is a way to deal with that also. If you manage your energies properly, if you manage your body and mind properly, these days I'm getting little lazy, otherwise for over twenty-five years, I manage with just about two and a half hours of sleep on an average. Today I'm sleeping anywhere between four to four and a half hours a day. But if I did not sleep for three nights and three days, nobody can make out anything is wrong with me, I will be the same, doing all my activity as I am. Why I am saying this is, what you call as life is the dynamism of this energy. What you call as death is static. Sleep is static, isn't it? Well, some amount of it is needed because sleep is the… rest is the basis of activity. But we are only resting to be active. We are not resting to rest, then you will rest in peace <laughs> Even if you are… Uh, I don't know what is uh, your sleep quota, being a lawyer <laughs> If you are sleeping eight hours a day, let us say, safely, hmm? I can assume eight hours. Eight hours a day, you are sleeping away one-third of your life. That is, if you live for hundred years, you actually lived only for sixty-six years. Rest you slept. If you came here to sleep, you can as well go to sleep, we can put you to sleep. What is the point? You came here to live, isn't it? Sleep is a small necessity, we have to take care of it. But have you come here to live or to sleep? You come here to live, that's only seven people saying that. No, I didn't mean the college, I mean life. <laughs> Maybe… Hey, you got a union? <laughs> I don't know if there is a sleeping union <laughs> because only seven people said I want to live. I'm not talking about the college or the university, I'm talking about your life. In this life, have you come to live and experience life in every possible way or have you come here to sleep? Yes. Live. If you come here to live, sleep would naturally become minimal. Have you noticed on a particular day when you're very happy, you're really, really happy for some reason? I won't go into the reasons <laughs> For some reason you're very happy, that day if you don't eat much, if you don't sleep much, it doesn't matter at all. Have you noticed this? Yes. Uh, you're a little depressed, you want to sleep. So sleep is not a tendency. Because you have made your existence in some way burdensome, sleep is a relief from that burden. When life is burdensome, you want to sleep away. If life is exciting and you're joyful and ecstatic, you don't want to sleep. You definitely don't want to sleep on a day when you're very happy, isn't it? On a day you're miserable, you want to sleep. So you first fix this, don't try to fix the sleep. You become an exuberant, joyful, alive life 
to what extent the body needs to sleep, it will sleep. You have a right to live, you have no right to sleep. Um, so the second question is, I often find myself in a situation where I'm not happy with myself. I compare my abilities, achievements and even my appearance with that of others. Also, I think since I'm a humanities student, people around me constantly uh, compare me with my other friends who have taken up medicine or engineering. And that really puts me off and I think that's one reason for my low self-esteem. How do you think I can uh, build up on my self-esteem and get rid of the self-hatred that I have? <laughs> well, this self-esteem, this self-confidence, all these things unfortunately have been sold a lot on the planet. Why do you need esteem? Why do you need esteem? Esteem is because you want to be little one-up on somebody else all the time. Unfortunately, our education systems were made like this, right from kindergarten, who is first, who is second, who is third? You want to be first. So your sense of happiness is only when everybody is doing worse than you. What kind of life is that? Why… why are we structuring our lives like this, that if everybody is doing badly, I will feel great? I think it's sickness. Hello? You think it's joy or sickness, please tell me. If you, all of you are doing badly, I feel great because I am number one now. No, this should go. From an early age, unfortunately, this is being imposed upon a child's mind that you have to be on top of everybody else. This is like I want you to just imagine if this happened to other creatures, let's say it happened to the plants and trees and animals. If an ant wants to become like an elephant, that is going to be a terrible ant-elephant, isn't it? Suppose a mango tree wants to become like a coconut tree, it will be a horrible mango tree because with one branch like this, no mangoes will come out of this. A mango tree is like this, a coconut tree is like that. That's how it should be. This has happened because in so many ways, people have put these things into your mind, what is good, what is bad, what is high, what is low, what is up, what is down. Because of this, you have never paid attention to every aspect of life in the sense Maybe humanities people and lawyers and what are you? Huh? Oh, the accounting people <laughs> You never paid attention to these things. I spend a lot of time paying attention to all kinds of creatures, ants and grasshoppers and worms and everything. If you observe, let's say an ant or let's pick up something little more than an ant, like a grasshopper, it's easier to see him. If you look at him carefully, whoever created this grasshopper has paid as much attention to a grasshopper as they have paid to this one. Please pay attention and see. When the source of creation has given equal attention to ant and you, who the hell are you to think an ant is a lowly creature and you are some superhuman being? Why are you making this judgment? Creation has not made this judgment. You may think you're superior simply because you're in a blatant manner, you're walking on this planet, but that's not true. The fact of the matter is like this. See, if all the worms on this planet, right now if all of them die, all the worms, in about twelve to eighteen months, all life on this planet will cease, everything, including you and me. Suppose all the insects die today, in something like two and a half to four years' time, all life will cease. But if all the human beings die, the planet will flourish. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, we make good manure. If human beings go away, right through this building trees will grow, isn't it? Yes or no? Everything will flourish. So, who the hell is telling you that you are the most significant life? This idea that the cosmos is human-centric is a stupid idea. In this cosmos, even this solar system is a tiny speck. Tomorrow morning if the entire solar system evaporates, nobody will notice it. That's how small it is. In that tiny speck, planet Earth is a micro speck. In that micro speck, Bengaluru is a super micro speck. In that, you are a very big person with great self-esteem. This is… this is not a simple problem. People suffer this for their whole life without handling it. Essentially, it is just this. You have gotten yourself into a place where most human beings are in this place, you get yourself into a place where you cannot handle your own thought process and your emotion, that's all. You meet fifty, sixty-year-old people, They've still not figured how to handle their thought and emotion. These are basic faculties. When the hell are you going to learn how to use your thought and emotion? Suppose you are uh, twenty years of age and you still don't know how to use your fingers, people will say you're handicapped, isn't it? You are whatever age you are and you still don't know how to use your thought and emotion, are you handicapped too? Hello? Are you or are you not? Yes. You are, you're crippling yourself. Why has this happened? It's simply because you have made unna unnatural divisions in the existence, which don't exist anywhere else except in human mind. Yes? Nowhere else does it exist except in human mind. Uh, because you're a little girl, can I call you a little girl? Okay. Yes, you can. No, I, I'm telling you the boy, she's not a little girl for me. She's a little girl <laughs> So, uh, when my daughter was growing up, she grew up with me traveling all over the place. When she was three and a half months of age, she's traveling with me alone. I'm driving all over India with her in the <laughs> strapped to the seat of the car. So, she grew up like this and every day we're in some different family. People are wonderful, but there is a problem with the adults. The moment they see a child, they want to teach the child something that's not worked in their life. <laughs> you should see this urge is so compulsive. The moment they see a child, they have to teach, they have to teach. <laughs> so I made one rule, see you can play with her as much as you want. You can talk to her, but nobody is going to teach her anything. They said, Sadhguru, <laughs> these girls <laughs> But Sadhguru, she won't learn anything, A, B, C, at least one, two, three. I said, no, one, two, three. Then they said, she won't know how to count even her fingers. I don't care. If she doesn't know how to count her fingers, as long as she knows how to use her fingers, I don't care. She thinks he has, she has a million fingers, what's my problem? But uh, they want to teach one, two, three, A, B, C, Mary had a little lamb. I said, I don't care whether Mary had a lamb or no lamb. You're not going to teach her anything. So nobody taught her anything. She's all years, everybody treated her… Because if you have nothing to teach, you have to teach… treat somebody like your equal. So she grew up by the time she's uh, two and a half, three years of age, she can speak in terms of remembering about seven hundred to eight hundred names, all adults, she thinks they're all her friends <laughs> because everybody spoke to her like she's an adult. And I would not have sent her to school but my schedule went totally crazy and I had to put her in some school. So when she was twelve, thirteen years of age, uh, one day she came back home and something that happened at school disturbed her. 
So she came and uh, came to me and said, you're teaching so… everybody so many things, you're not telling me anything. I said, see, I don't do it unsolicited. Now that you've come, just sit down. This is all you have to know. Never look up to anybody. She looked at me like this, what about you, kind of thing. I said, especially me, because the moment you look up to me, you will miss it completely. If you look at me just the way I am, there is a lot of value to it. If you look up to me, what will you do? Probably take my picture and nail it your wall, like you nailed so many people who are of value in this world. You just look at me for what I am, don't look up to me and never look down on anybody, this is all. Never look up to anything, never look down on anything. If you see everything just the way it is, everything has immense value. Everybody has a place and value to their life, isn't it? Every creature has value. Because we did not realize that, how many things we have destroyed in this world? Simply because we think this is valuable, this is not valuable. There is nothing here that is not valuable, everything has its value. Maybe you are not able to see it. So don't set yourself up like this, you versus the rest of the world, it's a bad competition to get into. You want to be number one on this planet, it's a horrible place. Everybody below you and you up, is it a good place to be? I think it's a sick place. This attitude of wanting to be ahead of somebody needs to go. Well, for fun in a game or something you compete, that's different. Life is not a competition, life is not a race. Li if life is a race, you must get to the finish line soon. Hello? I if you think life is a race, you must be at the finish line today, I, I can tell you how. <laughs> you want to go there? No. This is not a race. This is a tremendous privilege that we have come as human beings. This means our ability to experience life is of a much larger proportion than any other creature on this planet. That is the significance of who we are, yes? We can experience life in many more vivid ways than how an ant can experience, how a grasshopper can experience, how somebody else can experience. This is our privilege. Instead of experiencing life, we are trying to win the race. If you win the race, you should be in the crematorium today. Hello? <laughs> you don't need any self-esteem. In this culture, if you don't know this, there may be people with names like this, there will be one Ramadas, one Krishna Das, one whatever. What this means is people are consciously taking the name of being a slave because a joyful, willing slave is a tremendous human being. Only somebody who's been enslaved by somebody is a different matter. But willingly, I'm willing to do whatever is needed in this world, is a wonderful slave, isn't it? I'm one. And the next question is, um, I'm sure many of my friends will relate to this question. We find no purpose in what we are studying and <laughs> and we feel we are studying just for the sake of marks and uh, we feel uh, most of the times we regret for the decisions that we have made. We feel like trapped sitting inside the classroom. We want to go outside, explore the world, learn and do a lot of things outside the classroom. But we are also scared. If not studies, what else to do? If not studies, what should we what should we be doing in our life? How to get rid of this confusion? <laughs> well, uh, once you have made your education about marks, which again goes back to the previous question, you want to be ahead of somebody else. You want to be on top of the pile. Once you made it like this, you being miserable is natural. You should be. I would be very disappointed if you're not miserable <laughs> because you are trying to see that how everybody is beneath you, you must be miserable. Education is about an opportunity 
to explore things that you may not meet on the street. If you… you want to be outside on the Bangalore streets, all you will meet is disordered traffic, okay? <laughs> Whole… <laughs> totally disorganized traffic and terrible noise is what you… all you will meet. At one time this was called a garden city, that's different. But education is about exploring those dimensions which you will not meet on the street. This does not mean you have not seen the street, of course you've seen the street, you have explored it, you did not find e anything except plastic bags, filth, uh, cigarette butts and this and that, you didn't find anything more than that, right? Hello? On the street. So that is why you came and sat in the class. But because you have chosen something which doesn't mean anything to you, you have chosen something because somebody told you, if you do this course, you will get a better job. Again, you want to be better than somebody, that's all. When you invest your life in doing something that you don't care for, in my opinion, you must be miserable. Otherwise, what is the point of making the choices? What is the point of investing our lives in something that matters to us? Because when we in invest our life in something that matters to us, it may not be recognized by the world, you may not get good marks for it, but you are investing in your life what to… to what really matters to you. Well, at this stage in your life, if you've not figured out what that is, it doesn't matter. All you have to learn right now is, we call this sadhana, okay? In the spiritual parlance, this is called sadhana. What sadhana means is, the word sadhana literally translate as a tool. So this is about sharpening your tools, learning to use your body as a tool, learning to use your intellect and mind as a tool, learning to use your emotion and energy as a tool. Everything that you have should become your tools. That means they take instructions from you and do things for you. Right now, if you say, I'm miserable, essentially you can give it thousand reasons. Simply the basic thing that's happening is your intelligence is turned against you, that's all. Hello? If you remove half your brain, you will sit peacefully. Yes or no? So the problem is intelligence. Your own intelligence has turned against you. Now you can call it misery, now you can call it depression, now you can call it all kinds of things. You can give as many exotic names as you want. Essentially, your intelligence is not your sadhana. That means it is not in your hands to use it the way you want. It is turned against you. If you sit here, you're miserable by yourself. This means what? If you are with me and miserable, you can blame it on me. Sadhguru, it's because of you I am miserable, I am okay. But if you sit here alone and you're miserable, you're obviously in bad company, isn't it? Hello? So, this is one thing you must address. Education is not just about learning. All this learning business will be useless and meaningless in the next five to ten years. Once the machine learning comes, everything that you can learn in twenty years, one little gadget will know. Your phone can do ten PhDs a day. That's, a, that's what is going to happen in the next five to ten years. Because we have been misunderstanding memory as intelligence. Everything that you can do with your memory, a machine will be able to do better than you. So education is not just about learning. Education is about learning to use yourself. Learning to use your body, your mind, your emotion, everything in a certain way. It's very important that you know how to remain focused on something that doesn't mean a damn thing to you. It's very important. <laughs> See, people who say that they lack concentration, ah, they fall in love with the neighborhood somebody. Oh, they're fully concentrated. So it's not that they lack concentration. They say, I don't have good memory. Show them a suspense thriller movie, every scene they will remember. So their memory is pretty good. Only thing is they have not learned to use their mind in such a way, it doesn't matter what, they can apply themselves. If that is not there, you will not make a headway with your life. 
all the time world will not be throwing the kind of ball that you want to hit. Do you understand? When you go and stand at the cricket pitch, they're not going to throw the ball, the kind of ball that you want to hit, they will throw that ball that you cannot hit. Yes or no? Only when you hit that ball that is difficult to hit, then people will say you are fantastic. Hmm? <laughs> Otherwise you'll be playing baby games all your life. I will do only what I like, I'll do only what I like. Where is the question? See, people come to me and say, Sadhguru, we want to do the spiritual sadhana. Sadhguru, what do I have to do to get enlightened? Oh, it's a big order. Uh, you do one thing, uh, can you be here for three days? Uh, Sadhguru, a day after tomorrow evening, my uncle's daughter's niece, they're piercing her ears. <laughs> I have to be there. Oh, you want to get enlightened? <laughs> uncle's daughter's niece, ears being pierced and you have to be there. All right, two days we have. You do this, this and this for these two days. I said, Sadhguru, I don't like this <laughs> Okay, you do only what you like, you do one thing, write down things that you like and give me. Give me a sheet of paper and a pencil. I have never found anybody writing three or four things, maximum. In this entire cosmos, you like four things? Are you nuts? <laughs> I mean, see, if I like only two people here, and I don't like anybody else here, am I not kind of imprisoning myself? Hello? Am I not seriously constricting my life? I like only these two people, I don't like anybody else here. Is it a, a big, you know, crippling of myself? Yes or no? So why do you decide what you like and what you don't like? Whatever the hell you have to do, do it with full on. Whatever, it doesn't matter because this is not about learning. This is about learning to use yourself in the best possible way. Learning to use your body, your mind, turning this into your tools that you have the handle in your hands. Otherwise, if you leave it loose, this mind can cause you so much pain, you don't know. Right close by, there is a Nimhans Institute. All of you should take a tour. No, no, not to laugh, it's not a laughing matter. You must take a tour of the mental institution. You must see the people, what kind of sufferings they go through. They were just normal people like you, few days ago or few years ago, suddenly one day they'll flip. Because between sanity and insanity, the line is so thin. If you're sitting here and miserable by your own nature, are you not insane, I'm asking you? Hello? If your mind is out of control, then we call that insanity, isn't it? Hello? Is that insanity? Please sincerely tell me, in twenty-four hours' time, how many moments is your mind really in control? No, you don't have to go there, this institution is good enough for you <laughs> At this level of madness, this institution is good, that is why they're trying to train you <laughs> Now you… this is a time of your life where you learn how to use your mind the way you want. Not about what I like and don't like, whatever is needed I can do with my mind. This is your mind. Your mind does what it likes, this is not your mind, isn't it? Um, the next question is, um, there are times when we feel worn out. It might be because of the external pressure or emotional trauma that we are going through or because of the lack of inner strength. In such a situation or such a circumstance, what do you think would help us get back our interest and enthusiasm in life? Oh, worn out? How old are you? Can I ask how old are you? Okay. No, we won't tell you that. No, at this stage in your life, you should not be worn out for any reason. As you said, emotional trauma. 
So you need to understand this. These are all become regular words to be used in the society. People think they have a right to be stressed. See, if you say, I'm stressed, I'm stressed out, I'm worn out, I'm tens tense about something, tension, stress, all this, people think it is their right. It is not your right. It is a great disaster that you're unfolding upon yourself. Because stress, anxiety, all these things means you just don't know how to manage your thought process and your emotion, isn't it? Or even your chemistry, to look at it in a very fundamental way. See, what you call as peacefulness, what you call as joyfulness, what you call as blissfulness, what you call as ecstasy, what you call as agony, what you call as misery, what you call as anxiety, what you call as stress, all these experiences of life, pleasant ones and unpleasant ones, all of them have a chemical basis to it, yes or no? Hmm? There is a chemistry attached to it. Suppose you lose your peace today, what happens? First thing is you will snap at somebody who is at home, they always give the first dose. But people think it's natural, it's normal rather. Then you pick a quarrel with your neighbor, it goes on. Then on the street you will yell at somebody. Then you come here and shout at your professor. Ah, now people know you need medical attention. The moment you start screaming in a place where it's going to have serious consequences for you, people know you need medical attention. If you go to your doctor, initially he tries to talk you out of it, usually it doesn't work. So the next thing is he will throw a pill into you. You take this little pill, you feel little peaceful, not for good, at least for a period of time. It works in a limited way. What is this pill? Just a little bit of chemicals. If you put these chemicals, you're becoming peaceful. So what is peace? Certain kind of chemistry. What is joy? Another kind of chemistry. What is ecstasy? Another kind of chemistry. What is misery? Another kind of chemistry. Every human experience has a chemical basis to it. And now, this is the most sophisticated chemical factory on the planet. Do you agree with me? Most complex and sophisticated chemical factory on the planet is here. They say what is happening in a single molecule of DNA cannot be done in all the chemical factories on the planet put together. That much complex chemistry is happening. Now the question is only, are you a good manager of your chemical factory or are you a lousy manager? That's all the question is. Yes? If you manage a chemistry of blissfulness, people are always asking me, Sadhguru, how day in and day out with such variety of activity, how are you like this? Uh, I keep my… my factory is managed by me, not by my enemies. Your factory also must be managed by you, isn't it? If you manage this chemical factory, will you create chemistry of blissfulness or chemistry of uh, stress, anxiety and other things? Blissfulness. That's your choice? Yes. Very nice. If that is your choice, I'm sure that is the choice for everybody when it comes to themselves. You may want something else for your neighbor. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, but what you want for yourself is hundred percent clear, isn't it so? Hello? Highest level of pleasantness you want for this? Yes or no? Why such a simple thing is not happening? Simply because there is no sadhana, that means you have not turned the tools that have been given into you, given to you as your tools. See, we were… <laughs> we were trekking in… every year we are trekking in Tibet. So I'm in a tent, I'm doing some work, writing something. Another person is cutting an apple and there's one more person in the tent and that person tells this person, be careful, it's a very sharp knife. This irritates me because I call something a knife only if it's sharp <laughs> 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 
if it is a child, if it is a child, I understand, you say these things, this is a full-grown man. Then I say, hey, leave him alone. He is a full-grown man. He should know bloody how to handle a knife of all the things, not some complicated machinery, just a knife, leave him alone. No, Sadhguru, it's a very sharp knife. <laughs> say, I know it's sharp, that's why it's a knife, just leave him alone. Then I continue my work. Then quietly she whispers, be careful, it's a very sharp. <laughs> and after two minutes he cuts his hand. And I say, okay. <laughs> Why I'm telling you this is, we don't give a knife to a child's hand, not because a knife is dangerous, simply because a child's hand is not steady, he may harm himself or somebody else, yes? Knife is not a dangerous instrument, the hand which holds it can become dangerous, yes or no? Like is a car or a motorcycle a dangerous thing? No, it's a wonderful thing, but so many people kill themselves. If you do one mistake, it will take your life. If you handle it right, it makes your life. If you don't handle it right, it takes your life. But the greatest instrument that you have in your life is your own body and your mind. If you don't handle it right, it will take your life, of course. So this is all you are saying. This is simply because Right now, our entire system of education is about how to fix the world, not about how to make this into a tr tremendous instrument in my life. How my body, my mind, my chemistry, my intelligence must work for me. Once these things don't work for you, you are a finished case. Do what you want. Once your intelligence is turned against you, no power in, those, in the universe can save you, isn't it so? because enough work has not been done on it, no attention has been paid as to how this functions. You… you agree with me, this is the most sophisticated machine on the planet? Yes. Is it nap time for the law students? <laughs> Hello? I'm asking for a higher opinion. <laughs> is it nap time? No. Is this the most sophisticated machine on the planet? Have you read the user's manual? No. Oh! When are you going to read it? Because in this society people are telling you, you do all those things after seventy years of age. When you're no good for anything, then you read the user's manual. <laughs> if you buy a phone, should you read the user's manual in the first three days or after three years when you're discarding the phone? Huh? Earliest possible time you must read if you want to make use of that instrument, isn't it? So this is what sadhana means. Sadhana means not doing something crazy. Sadhana means doing whatever it takes so that my body, my energy, my emotion, my thought is in my hands. If you gain mastery over your physical body, fifteen to twenty percent of your life and destiny will be in your hands. If you take charge of your mind, sixty to seventy percent of your life and destiny will be in your hands. If you take charge of the very life energies that you have, one hundred percent of your life and destiny will be in your hands. Young people should do this first before you mess with the world. Before you mess with the world, you must fix this, isn't it? Sadhguru, uh, just a follow-up question to that. Uh, in helplessness, many youngsters start thinking of taking the extreme step of ending their life. Uh, on this topic, many questions were asked. One of them is, many of my close friends are suicidal. What could I do to help them considering is it, that… Is it your friendship which is doing this? No, 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 no. This is the question that I got from the audience. <laughs> this is one of the questions. I thought you were quite a friend <laughs> Okay, that person want to know that uh, how can that person uh, help her friends <laughs> 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 help her friends uh, to 
get rid, rid of this thought and uh, they don't want to do yoga. That's a rider, huh? <laughs> so, let's uh, answer from this end. First of all, what is yoga? Well, uh, right now unfortunately even in this country where it all began, people's idea of yoga is actually a rebound from the American coast. They think yoga means twisting yourself into various postures, <laughs> impossible postures. That you should look like a leftover noodle. No, I want you to understand what yoga means. Yoga means union. Union means, see right now you are here, even you are breathing? Your friend also breathing? You think so? Okay. Of course you are eating food, drinking water, there are many other levels of transactions, but at least these very physical things you understand. Without this transaction, you cannot exist, isn't it so? Hello? So in a way, what this is telling you is, you are just a small creature, just a small pop-up. You have pop-ups on your phone screen which pop up and pop out. On this planet, you are just a pop-up and you will pop out. Yes. So you think you are an individual existence by yourself. No, if you lose connection with the atmosphere around you, you will die, isn't it? If you don't eat or drink, you will die. Not just that, every cell, every subatomic particle in this body is in transaction. If the transaction doesn't happen, you can't exist for a moment. But psychologically, you get yourself into such a cocoon that you think you are an individual existence all by yourself. Yoga means you consciously obliterate the boundaries of your individuality. Because if you do not consciously obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, then unknowingly your life is you versus the universe. It's a very… you must listen to me on this one, you can take my advice on this, it's a bad competition to get into. You versus the universe, definitely you will feel like dying. When you face such a big competition, it's not worth living, it'll become like that. So how people normally handle it is, by obliterating it in unconscious ways a little bit. Uh, somebody falls in love with somebody, suddenly they've opened up the boundaries of their individuality a little bit to somebody. The English expression of falling in love is a good expression because something of you has to fall. You can't rise in love, you can't fly in love, you can't climb in love, you have to fall in love. That means… <laughs> that means something of you has to be stripped, something of you has to fall down. You have to make space for something else, little bit of unconscious yoga you did. Does he still don't want to do yoga? So this longing to become… to break the boundaries, if it finds very physical, basic expression, we call this sexuality. If it finds emotional expression, we call this a love affair. If it finds a mental expression, it gets labeled as ambition, conquest or uh, simply shopping. If it finds a conscious expression, we call it yoga. In your life, what do you think? Whatever you do in your life, is it better to do consciously or unconsciously? What do you think? Consciously. So if you do a conscious obliteration of your boundaries, you understand you are unnecessarily building a psychological structure where you're feeling trapped. If you consciously obliterate this, this is called yoga. If you obliterate it physically, it's called sex. 
If you obliterate it emotionally, it's called love. If you try to obliterate it mentally, it's called achievement, conquest, ambition, fulfillment, victory, these kind of things. But all those things, how long do they last? Momentarily, because it's unconscious. If you consciously obliterate the boundaries of your individuality, you can sit here like the universe with the same stability. Now, where do you want to die and go? Because anything that you did not make, you have no right to destroy, isn't it? Did you make this life? Hello? Did you make this life? Are you capable? No. Then how come? Your only problem is your mental structure has become a mess. You can easily unmess it. They must do yoga. <laughs> but Sadhguru, a lot of us youth, uh, how do we make time to it? How do we make time to do sadhana? Because we're so tied up, we probably uh, stay up a little late completing projects, assignments. Not, not just the youth, but a lot of the seniors also. They probably stay up till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock and then wake up again by 6 o'clock in the morning and rush to their work offices. 7, 8 o'clock. I, I personally leave, by, uh, leave my house at 7.30, 8 o'clock and reach college by 9. So, how do I make time? Not just me, but there are a lot of other individuals who probably have the same question. So, how do we deal with this? See, time, the demand of time is very minimal. To be conscious, do you need time? Hmm? Your enemy walking unconsciously, can you not walk consciously? Would you walk more efficiently if you walk consciously? Hello? If you drive, if you walk, if you read, if you write or whatever the hell you do, would you do it better if you were doing it consciously? So in what way does it come in the way of time? Well, there may be some practice to stabilize you. Investment of let's say twenty, thirty minutes a day may be there. You have to make time because if you make the time, one thing is your own psychological structure gets so organized. I can show you this. Suppose we take a video of you when you think you're working, busy. We've done this to people. How many unnecessary movements you have with your body and how many unnecessary vacillations of mind you have. If you look at it, if these things get little organized, Suddenly you would see, there's a whole lot of time on your hands. What you can do, let us say in eight to ten hours a day, if you follow a simple regimen, which will cost you maybe thirty minutes a day, if you follow a simple regimen like this, the same eight hours of work you will be easily able to do in four to six hours. So you gain and your sleep quota slowly starts… Re as the system becomes more and more dynamic, the need for sleep will come down that you will not sleep in the court and let your client hang. <laughs> it's very important, you know. See, once you take up a certain profession, you must understand the significance of that on other people's lives. Suppose somebody is banking on you and you slept off in the court, the guy may hang. So. It doesn't matter what is the nature of your job, it has a significant cont contribution, isn't it? Whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or let's say a bus driver, if you are not alert and fully there, would it be a disaster for somebody else? Hmm? You must know this, that when you're doing this, you must understand in how many ways you're contributing to somebody's life just by doing the simple job that you're doing. But unfortunately, most people think they're doing it for the money that they get. Money will come anyway if you do something well, all right? The important thing is, the joy of doing an activity is that you know how many lives you're touching by doing what you're doing. Whether even if you're driving an auto rickshaw, are you of a great service to a whole lot of people every day? If you are conscious of this, how joyfully you would drive, why would you think of committing suicide? the world would be not against you. Right now you have made yourself into a cubicle, a small cubicle, your own cubicle that you built and it's a prison that you built but you can't break. Why this happens to you is because 
because of fear of suffering, people build a wall of self-preservation. For their self-preservation, they build a wall. The walls that you build for self-preservation are also walls of self-imprisonment. When you think there is a threat, you built a wall around your house. But after some time, even if there is no threat, you cannot come out of your house because there is a wall. This is the nature. You must understand this, there are two dimensions to you. There is one dimension of you which is always looking at self-preservation. There is another dimension of you which wants to expand all the time, wants to step into new territory all the time. Why this is happening to you is, even if physiologically if you have to look at this, within your brain, there is another brain which is called the reptilian brain, which is just about the size of your fist. This is the size of a, let's say a crocodile's brain, it's a reptilian brain. That part of your brain is always talking about how to fix boundaries, how to safeguard yourself, self-preservation is its prime quality. But you became human only because of the cerebral cortex which evolved over a period of time. Now this part of the brain always wants to explore, always wants to step into something new. Whatever happens in our life, we want something more to happen. This wants to expand limitlessly. Which one do you want to empower within your life is something that you have to take charge as early as possible in your life. Otherwise, you will build a prison wall around yourself without knowing why, you're just miserable. Now, you have… Uh, you have seen the street dogs all the time going around peeing all over the place? You think he has a urinary tract issue? No, he is building a pea kingdom all the time. He is instinctively geared that he must have a boundary of his own. Always he is trying to set up his boundary. But this is what being human means, that we can consciously break all boundaries and live here. This is what yoga means. That means consciously you obliterated your boundary and you're here as a part of the existence, not against the existence. You must find time. You were speaking about uh, how it is very important to realize about life and death. So, of course, I did not decide to be born. A lot of us, because we did not decide to be born. But certain countries <laughs> have taken up this issue of euthanasia very seriously and they have, they have legalized this uh, pulling of the plug. So, do you think man is prudent enough to pull the plug? Well, if you don't plug in, you don't have to pull the plug. See, <laughs> it is not only about this, there's one more thing. Recently, somebody in Mumbai has filed a case on his parents. I didn't ask to be born, so I want to sue you because you got me into this mess. I thought they feel that way in Mumbai, thought Bangalore was little. <laughs> but now you're asking why should you pull the plug? It's like this. You know, we… our center in the United States is in Tennessee. The nearest town is called McMinnville. Tennessee is called a volunteer state because in the… <clears throat> in the Civil War, the Tennessee people volunteered and made a difference. They fought as volunteers. They could have gone both ways because they're in between state, but they volunteered for the South. So they're called a volunteer state. That culture of volunteering is still there. So there are volunteers, all kinds of people volunteer for all kinds of jobs. So there is a hospital where every day, Sunday morning, every week rather, Sunday morning at eleven o'clock, somebody dies. So Tennessee being what it is, uh, devil's work is happening, something is happening, all kinds of excitement and imaginations happened, eleven o'clock, anyway somebody will die in that hospital. It became a routine. Then we went. Every Sunday morning, eleven o'clock, because they all go to the church in the morning and uh, after ten o'clock they're volunteering in the hospital, every week eleven o'clock somebody dies just around eleven o'clock. 
Then we found out that there is this… Uh, in Tennessee is the Jack Daniel land, okay? They soaked in whiskey a bit. So one of those soaked in whiskey kind of volunteer comes and he has to scrub the floor. When he's scrubbing the floor of the ICU, he sees all these cables are in his way, so he unplugs all that, scrubs everything and puts it back and goes. By the time he's finished scrubbing, every week around eleven o'clock somebody dies <laughs> So unplugging <laughs> What is this? Uh, oh, it's not the… Unplug with Sadhguru, you know <laughs> If you do not know this, eighty percent, eighty percent of the medical care expense in the United States happens in the last twenty-three days of somebody's life. That is nearly three trillion dollar bill, all right? is the medical care, in that eighty percent is spent in the last twenty-three days. If people are willing to die twenty-three days early on an average, nearly two point five trillion dollars the country could save. And those twenty-three days are not wonderful twenty-three days, those twenty-three days are this kind of days. They have to check every few minutes whether you're alive or dead, that kind of aliveness. So, because we have advanced in medical science, we are able to drag it and drag it and drag it as if we should not die. No, it is very important we should live gracefully, when time comes we should die gracefully. This doesn't mean you don't give them medical care, but when a judgment is made that there is no way for this person to recover, it's best they go home quietly die, unless they're in a painful condition, some pain medications can be given. There's no need to go on pushing them one more day, one more day because all this does is… this is just feeding the medical industry, that's all. This is not doing any good to that person, nor to the family. It is just feeding the medical industry, it has to go. But how to take this call is a difficult call. It's a very difficult call, people may start misusing it in so many different ways. So we have to set up a system that misuse can be almost eliminated or minimized to the minimum minimum level because people may start misusing it. The families may misuse it, the doctors may misuse it, some enemies may misuse it. If people have wealth, so much misuse may happen. So we need to take care about that. But at the same time, this is a misuse of science also that a man in every way the life wants to go, but you don't let it go, you want to push it one more day, one more day because the bills are going up, it's not right. So it's a hard call to take, but we have to take that call somewhere. The next question is, uh, Sadhguru, human body is made up of an unimaginable number of atoms, particles and molecules and even the mind is really very complicated. With these… these two complicated instruments, how is one expected to live a simple life? <laughs> it depends how you describe simple life. If you think being a simple ton is simple life, I don't recommend that. But simple life generally meant that the arrangements that you make around your life are simple so that it doesn't entangle you, it only supports you. See, all arrangements that we make in our lives are supposed to enhance our life, isn't it? Why do you get educated? Because you think it'll enhance your life. Why somebody gets married? Because they think it'll enhance their life. Why people have children? Because they think it'll enhance their life. Why they're doing business? Because they think it'll enhance their life. But look at people's faces and see, before they got educated, before they got married, before they had children, how they were and how they have become today, does it look like they're enhanced? <laughs> Hello? 
they become like this. So obviously, they made so many arrangements that they cannot handle. They made more arrangements than they can actually handle, isn't it so? They did not make arrangements consciously, what is needed for me? Their problem is she is every day going shopping. So I also want to go shop shopping, I don't know what to shop but I'll shop something and come because she is also shopping my neighbor. <laughs> so because they are in this condition, though there is no container service at the end of life, most homes have turned into warehouses. Most people have things in their homes that they have not used for a year or two and still there. They can't give it away, but it is cluttering their life in such a way they have to trip all over the place to walk around in their homes because they did not build this home, they did not buy these things, they did not form these relationships as a way of enhancing their life. They are using everything to entangle their life. So simple life means you are not entangled, it's very important. You are enhanced but you are not entangled. You make whatever the kind of arrangements you make, but the kind of arrangements you can handle, isn't it? You don't try to make arrangements like somebody else and you don't know how to handle. Suppose you want to build a palace. A palace means you need five hundred people to service the damp place every day. How many people are going to live there? A family of four or will you have hundred children? See, always in the past, the kings had a… Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you <the laughs> uh, huh? In Mahabharata. Yes, one hundred children, all right. You planning something like that? Then don't make such arrangement. <laughs> then do not make such an arrangement. Why do you make an arrangement that you don't need? If you make an arrangement that you don't need, these arrangements will become entangling. So if you… what kind of arrangement is best for you? You just make that. This is a simple life. Simple life does not mean you're a simple ton, all right? You keeping it in such a way, any time you… wherever you need to go, you can go, whatever you have to do, you can do. I was… Uh, you know, because our center is in Tennessee. <laughs> I… I hope it's appropriate because this is not in any… Uh, this thing. In United States of America, there is a segment of people who believe that next time when Jesus comes, he will come in United States. Generally, it's believed he will come in Mount Olive in Jerusalem, but now U.S. people are saying, why will he go to Israel? That's not a good place to go. He will come in United States. So they asked me a question like this in a large gathering, Sadhguru, what do you think? Jesus will come in United States or in Jerusalem? I said, see, last time he came in Jerusalem and he said, come follow me. Only twelve people, hmm? Today you are celebrating him as a great being, but only twelve people followed him. In that one of them freaked on him, all right? But if he comes to United States today, if he says, come follow me, you have a bank loan, student loan, car loan, house loan, holiday home loan, you are mortgage for forty-five years. <laughs> if Jesus says, come follow me, nobody will be there because everybody has to go to the bank. So you have entangled yourself in such a way, even if the most significant things happen, you can't change the direction of your life. Hello? If the greatest things came your way, you cannot change the direction of your life. This is a slave's life, isn't it? What is slavery? He cannot choose. That is slavery, isn't it? Now, you are making that kind of arrangements in your life, you cannot choose, you are stuck in your own arrangements. A spider whips a web for other things to be caught, but if you are that kind of a spider, you build a web in which you are caught, you are a stupid spider, isn't it? And most human beings are in that condition. <laughs> so simplicity means, a sensible arrangement which will not entangle you. You made an arrangement in such a way, 
If something significant happens here, you are going this way, if something really significant happened this way, you can go this way, your arrangements will not trap you. That is a simple life. This is an intelligent life. Simplicity does not mean a simple tongue. If you are smart enough, you will make arrangements that support you, not arrangements that entangle you, isn't it? As a part of Sadhguru's uh, global campaign, to see, to answer uh, questions regarding truth and sharing words of wisdom, he started the Youth in Truth campaign and the Unplug with Sadhguru series. Uh, we will now uh, have a few questions from the social media. So the question is, Sadhguru, is it all right to be ordinary or should I be special at something? <laughs> and this question is asked by Shruti. That reminds me, there was a time when uh, Isha Yoga, we had to… we used to print a brochure called Isha Yoga, from ordinary to extraordinary. It was a seven, eight day program. People came and day one, day two, they said, Guru, you said something special will happen, nothing special happened to me. Where did I say anything special will happen? No, in the brochure it said, ordinary to extraordinary. I said, ordinary to extraordinary <laughs> That means, you have no need to be special. You became far more ordinary than everybody else and other people think you are extraordinary, that's their issue. But you have become very ordinary, more ordinary, you are consciously ordinary. Because wanting to be special is a sickness. I want to be special means what? Again, I want to sit on top of everybody's head. No, just be ordinary. Ordinary is very extraordinary because creation is extraordinary, isn't it? an ordinary ant, an ordinary leaf, an ordinary flower, aren't they extraordinary? Hello? Tell me which is just not worthwhile in this creation. Just… just look at it and tell me. Just tell me one blade of grass, can you create it, if it's so ordinary? No, everything is extraordinary, but none of them are trying to be special. Wanting to be special is an ailment, you should not get into that. Well, to be yourself as ordinary as possible, so that you don't have to pretend, you don't have to act up, you don't have to prove anything to anybody, this leaves you enormous amount of time and energy. You were asking about time. If you… see, once… <laughs> you don't have to do this, I'm just joking, okay? See, I get every day ten minutes more than you simply because I don't care how I look. If I have to remove every hair on my face, ten, fifteen minutes it'll take. That you have chosen to take away everything, it's easier. Suppose I want little, it'll take much more time, one hair more if it goes away, you know, so much repair I have to do. So you just want to be ordinary. This is how life made you. Creation made you like this, must have some intent, isn't it? So, if you just shift from looking good to being good, you will become very ordinary and very wonderful <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the next question has been asked by Rahul. What is the right age to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Rahul is… wants a boyfriend? It's legal <laughs> So, uh, I think every child has boyfriends and girlfriends. Yes? When you were uh, three, four, five years of age, didn't you have boyfriends and girlfriends? You had. Now you are giving it a new meaning to the simple friend. Well, 
A friend need not necessarily mean you have to get physical with them. Hello? This is something that you have picked up from certain societies where body is everything. See, why is it so that today it has become like… This was only in United States but today it's everywhere. If you say a relationship, people think it's a body-based relationship. Well, don't I have a relationship with you right now? Don't you have a relationship with your parents, your friends, your teachers? You don't have a relationship? Hello? Yes. yes. But you cannot say, if you say, I have a relationship with my teacher, they will think, oh, you are doing some hanky-panky with your teacher <laughs> Why have we become like this? See, the problem is just this, your intelligence has been hijacked by your hormones. If I say, you are my friend, that means I must mess with your body, is that a necessity? Hello? Can't we be? Okay, you're a girl if you're my friend, but I can't say you're my girlfriend because it'll be understood in a different way. Why this has happened is we are giving too much significance to body-based relationships. You must understand there are relationships deeper than the body. You can hold such profound relationships with people without your body being involved in it, isn't it so? Possible or no? Well, body-based relationship may be necessary with somebody, that is fine, that's your choice, but that is only possible in a limited way. But friendship and relationships are possible at various levels with enormous number of people, possible or no? You can hold intimate relationships with thousands of people. I have very intimate relationship. I as… the way I am sitting here right now, I assume a certain intimacy with you. But if I use the word intimacy, people think two bodies should be rubbing. See, if two bodies are rubbing, only skin is touching, all right? Skin is the outermost cover of who you are, how can that be intimate? I don't consider that intimate. <laughs> I can penetrate people, not just their minds and their emotion, their very innards, their very life process, I hold that kind of relationships with people, where my life energy reverberates with their life energy. That is intimate, that's really intimate. Body rubbing, okay, it's maybe a necessity at a certain stage of one's life, it's okay. We are not trying to make it right or wrong, it's one's choice. But don't make that the basis of friendship. Why can't you be friend with every girl and every boy around you? Hello? So, essentially you're asking, at what age should I go into sexually oriented relationships? Is that what you're asking? But I think it'll be… you'll be doing a great service to yourself and to the world if you remove this boyfriend-girlfriend business and call it something else, call them your… Uh, what? Romance or your love affair or whatever, because Friend, the word friend must be released from the body, it's very important. Otherwise, friendships won't happen, everybody will be like this because if I say you're my friend, she's afraid, unnecessarily, isn't it? If… if I say she's my friend, she will fear, what is he up to? How is he my friend? F release the word friend from the body, it's very important. Let friendships happen all over. Well, body-based relationships happens with uh, another individual, that's different, that's your choice. At what age? See, when you're in education, as I said, first you make these instruments. If you don't take charge of these instruments at this stage in your life, believe me, your own body, your own mind will trip you in so many ways right through your life. You won't ride them, they will ride you. That should not happen. At this stage in your life, let the focus fundamentally be on how to grow yourself to the best possible place within yourself. Don't be in a hurry to live, living will happen a little later. If you live too early, you will not live too well. Don't try to live too early. I am not a moralistic person to tell you do this, don't do this. If somebody has such a compulsive need, they can do it. 
but everybody need not make it a trend that if you're in college, you must have a sexually oriented re relationship with somebody, there is no compulsion like that. There is no such rule that it must be so. One can grow. There is a… I've spoken this before, but uh, I must tell you this. Among the mang mango farmers, there is a practice. If you… across India, this is well known. If you plant a mango sapling, within twelve, fourteen months, flowering will happen when the season comes. A mango farmer meticulously removes every flower from the plant because if you let it go, it will bear fruit. One or two fruits will come out of this little plant. Only those which are not allowed to fruit up to three to four years will become full-blown trees and bear lot of fruit. Those plants which bear fruit too early will never be become full-fledged trees. So a mango farmer has this wisdom, he keeps on nipping off every flower. Similarly, human beings should not be in a rush to live. The important thing is, before you try to live, you are in a place high enough so that life will roll out well for you. You live too early, then it could become an uphill task all your life. And tomorrow, many turmoils are happening. See, if you go to Western universities, right now I was just at Ross Business School just this week, I was at Ross Business School, then in Harvard Business School and uh, if you look there, I don't know what's the percentages, but people tell me or if you just look around you will see, most of the faces there are Indians, Chinese and like this, only about forty percent are Caucasian race or American white though they are the majority population there. Why this is happening is, these Indian families and Chinese families, their children have a certain support system and they have to live with their parents till they are twenty-five or so, till they finish their university. But generally the white families, by the time they're eighteen, they're out of their families, they're all living with their partners, they are going through emotional stuff, they have to make some money for that and daily evening they have to take care of their partners, no time to go to the library, no time to study. All the toppers are Indians, Jewish community and Chinese. You just see across the universities in the United States. So what does this mean? A whole lot of Americans are not even finishing university simply because they have a boyfriend and a girlfriend going and it will not always go smooth, things will happen, daily turmoils, problems, you know. Every day these things are happening. So, it is very important, this will not come back to you. This time of your life will not come back to you. Well, people were asking me, Sadhguru, why are you doing this youth and truth? Wherever I go, one common refrain is, when I meet people, they say, Sadhguru, where were you when I was twenty? Now you come when I'm sixty, what am I supposed to do? Then I decided, okay, let me step out and meet all those people who are below twenty-five years of age. That's why this Youth and Truth movement started. <laughs> now, you need to understand that this is a time of your life when you're at the highest level of energy. At this stage in your life, if you create a certain focus and balance within yourself, this energy will translate into something fantastic. But at this stage in your life, if you do not bring focus and balance and you earn it, let's say when you're forty, forty-five, you will not have the same energy. This is something that youth don't understand, that they think this level of energy will be there all your life. No, 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 it will pass. It is just a question of eight to twelve to fifteen years maximum. From the age of fourteen to thirty, there is a certain upsurge of energy. At this time, if you learn how to manage this, keep a balance and focus to your life, if you bring a focus to your life, this life will function and play at a higher level of life. If you don't bring those things and you're in a hurry to live, then you will see it becomes an uphill task. Not that you won't make it at all, you may make it, but unnecessary struggles through life. So it's individual choice. If somebody has such a strong compulsion, they may go for it. Don't make it a trend that if you're in a college, you must have a body-based relationship, not necessary. 
The floor is now open for all fellow Christians to ask questions. So if there are any, yeah. My name is Sinchana from the Department of Management Studies. So uh, my question is, how do I see or understand Adiyogi as um, uh, as a Swayambhu, which is self-born, and Ajja as unborn, since both are contradictory. Also, he he's referred as limitless and nothingness. So, can you can you please state your opinion? Say, uh, today you're in. Please sit down. You're in management studies. If you complete these studies and go to work somewhere. People say you're a manager. Over a period of time, those people who work around you, they keep referring to you as a manager and in their experience you are a manager, isn't it? What… whatever you may think within yourself, maybe you will also start believing you're a manager. But others definitely see you as a manager, similarly with various things. So Adi Yogi literally means the first yogi. A yogi means who consciously obliterated all boundaries around him. See, because you have a set boundary, this is me, that is you. Suppose you… the boundaries actually exist only for the physical body, isn't it? This is my body, that's your body. This is my mind, that's your mind. But I want you to understand, there is no such thing as this is my life and that is your life. This is a living cosmos. You captured a little bit of it, I captured a little bit of it, somebody else captured a little more, that's about it. Now, if you're identified with your body, you're somebody, yes? <laughs> if you're identified with your mind also, you call yourself, I'm this or that. But if your identity is not with your physicality or with your psychological structure, you're really a nobody, isn't it? If you're a nobody, are you limited or unlimited? So when we say yogi, we are in many ways saying he is a nobody because he is not identified with his body. Well, he has a body, but he is not identified with it. See, what you call as my body right now, just some time ago was probably a papaya or a carrot or a fruit or a vegetable or something, isn't it so? Hello? You don't like that. What do you like? It was some food… something… something to be eaten, isn't it so? You ate that and now it's sitting here as my body or your body. Before that it was just soil that you walk upon. And after some time, again it'll become soil. Most people don't get this point unless you bury them. That you're just a little bit of this planet, aren't you? Aren't you? Just a piece, little bit of soil. When we bury you, you understand, but it's a bit late. But if you realize right now, whatever I call as myself is all accumulation from outside. That was not me, okay <laughs> Somebody unplugging something <laughs> So, if you… your identity is not with things that you have gathered, what would you identify with? If you identify with the fundamental life process, it's not here, it's just happening all over the place. So in that sense we are saying he is limitless because he is not sitting there as a body, nor is he sitting there as a psychological structure. Both these things are outside influences on you. About him being a swayambhu, it means that he is self-made, everything that he is. See, today you're sitting here, you may not be conscious, but your father, mother, your grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents, if you go a hundred thousand generations, all of them are in some way living through you, isn't it? Yes? You may not consciously remember, but your great-great-great-grandmother's nose is sitting on your face without you being conscious about it. Yes or no? 
So, this is an accumulation of memory, first of all. There is evolutionary memory, there is genetic memory and karmic memory and various other forms of memory. In yoga, we identify memory as eight different fundamental forms in which this body is formed. Because these eight different memories are there, memory means it's a software that's been given to you. This is why it grows like this. Suppose whatever food you eat, I know you eat the same kind of food, but suppose you eat certain kind of food, the same food, if I give it to my dog, will it become you? Or if I give my dog's food, will you become a dog? Nothing like that will happen. This body will never get confused, isn't it? Because the software is well entrenched. Put whatever you want, this will do the same thing because the memory is well established. So what you call as myself right now is not you. It is a consequence of a huge amalgamation of memory. A little bit you have added your character to it, but rest of it is all come to you from somewhere else. So when we say a swayambhu, because he is no way using his ancestry, no way using the faculties or the memories of the body, he has placed himself above that. He is completely himself, not a consequence of history, not a consequence of genetics, but he is all by himself. So we call him, he is totally self-made or he is a swayambhu. Namaskaram Sadhguru, uh, my name is Prashant. Where, uh, where are you? Yes. Okay. Namaskaram. Uh, my question to you is, uh, whenever we make decisions, there is always a right or wrong decision. Whether the decision taken is right or wrong is only eventually re realized. How would I know uh, I took the right decision and how will I know if I'm uh, taking the right decision or wrong decision while making? But why are you copying a question? Huh? Copying it, uh, that's what I had in mind, so I wrote it down. Okay. No, no, I've… Uh, I was never so interested in the examinations, I never bothered. But I saw when I was in college, lot of people inside their sleeve, here, there, everywhere they've written and uh, all kinds of chits and things, but they were all copying answers. <laughs> Question you copy because… No, no, I'm not trying to make a comment on you because this is everywhere. Because you are creating such a level of conflict within yourself for every simple thing that you think you could always be doing something wrong, something wrong, something wrong. Well, joyfully do something wrong, it's okay. Hello? Nobody know, knows really whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Do they know for hundred percent? No. So don't bother yourself too much about is this right, is this wrong. It is just that when you do something, is this bringing well-being to me and everybody around me? That's all your concern is. People who think they're always right, they're terrible people. You produce tyrants out of this. I am always right, I made all the right decisions in my life. This is a tyrant, this is not a human being. It becomes a very ugly human being who does everything right. You don't have to do right things, just be a little more human. Just make sure when you do something, it's good for you and good for everybody around you, that's all. It is right, it is wrong, who is to decide? If it's bringing well-being to everybody, it is the right thing, isn't it? Nobody can decide what is right and what is wrong because for a thousand years they've debated the same things and nobody has come to a conclusion as to what is right and wrong. And people who believe they're doing the right things, they did the most horrendous things to each other, always. So instead of looking at right and wrong, which is a consequence of a morality that you… in which you believe, why don't you awaken the humanity within you? Why don't you become a living humanity? Humanity means just this, already we spoke about this. Animal nature means fixing boundaries. Human nature means expanding or including everybody into your boundaries because this is a natural Longing, wherever you are, you want to be something more, something more, what is this? This is because your intelligence has come to a place where it doesn't like boundaries, it wants to expand. This is human nature. Human nature is naturally inclusive. 
Animal nature is exclusive, it wants to fix boundaries. So instead of being in boundaries of right and wrong, even if somebody is wrong, let's include them and do the best we can. Because the moment you think I'm doing all the right things, those… everybody looks wrong in your life. See, please sincerely address this and see, most people are in this condition. Except themselves, everybody is wrong somewhere. If everybody is wrong and only you're right, it's a sign of madness, it is not a sign of being right. <clears throat> so do not waste your time in right decisions, wrong decisions. When you are reasonably balanced and clear and happy, not frustrated about something, make a decision, throw your life into it, something wonderful will happen. You may not do the right thing, but you may do a great thing, you may do a wonderful thing, that's good enough. How far will I go? What will happen? Well, that depends on various things, your own intelligence, your competence and the times in which we exist. You should not discount the times in which we exist. At different times in history, different things take off. We may be in sync with it, what we are may be appreciated today or what we are may be appreciated tomorrow or what we are may be appreciated after we are gone. But whatever we did in our life, we did with total involvement because life is in its involvement, life is not in its correctness. Your involvement must be unbridled. Whatever you do, see how everybody's well-being is included in this. If you are an inclusive process and you're involved, it is fine. Are you right or wrong? Right or wrong? Till the last day of your life, you cannot really decide what is right and wrong because there will always be another set of people who say this is wrong, isn't it? Can we have a question from the top, please? Namaste sir. My name is Lekashri, I'm from Institute of Management. My question is, how to learn accepting the truth? Because most of the time truth is bitter and it is a hard part. So I uh, always tend to make a few adjustments and assumptions which will make my life little easy but I'm far from the truth. So how do I start learning accepting the truth and following the hard okay. path and being right. Okay. Right now there are uh, more… there are more conclusions in this than questions. First of all, you have concluded truth is bitter. Let's understand this, what truth is. Right now, if I take this object and leave it now, it is going to go this way. Yes? Hello? Ma'am? Yourself? If I leave it now, this is going to go up. That's the truth. No? Hello? No. It'll come down. Is it bitter? This is what truth means. <laughs> truth means you figured out how life works. You observed, you didn't make it up. A lie means you made it up. Truth means you observed, you paid enough attention to life that you realize this is how it works. Why will it be bitter? If you discover how it works, will life become smooth and easy or bitter? Most complex things you can do effortlessly because you know how it works. When you do not know how something works, that's when life is bitter, isn't it? So whoever is telling you truth is bitter, uh, They've invested too much in lies, what to do? <laughs> you, you have a law… No, no, I was asking for a lawyer's opinion <laughs> So do not make such conclusions. Truth means… See, only truth works. Please, please listen. Only truth works, but you cannot accept it right now. So I want you to see it this way. Observe life. What really works on all levels of life must be the truth, huh? What really works on all levels of life must be the truth, isn't it? So please pay attention, there is no acceptance or rejection. How can you reject something that really works wonders for you? How will you reject it? I'm asking how can you reject it? Can you? That's it. Please. 
Will I run last question? No, it's all the last question. Will you leave it to Sadhguru to decide? Yes, sir. Sir, you have to leave Sadhguru here. What's, oh, yes ma'am. Uh, good evening, I am Sindhuja from Department of Life Sciences. I would like to know your opinion on present day art, like the modern art, the films, the videos, and its influence on present day generation. Oh, they're not interested in art, but I will answer this question, please. It happened once, Mrs. Murjani was in Paris and she's a high socialite. She went into a modern art museum and she looked at each piece of art disdainfully and made nasty comments about everything. Then she came and stood in front of a frame and said, who did this horrible piece of work? Then the curator said, ma'am, this is not artwork, this is a mirror <laughs> So, <laughs> well, uh, if you're talking about modern art, there has been some spectacular modern art breaking all norms and creating something really beautiful, intricate and wonderful. At the same time, a whole lot of let me not say a whole lot, quite a bit of modern art has turned bizarre. Everybody wants to do something different without a purpose. When you want to desperately do something different, you turn bizarre. This has happened to modern art, this is also happening to fashion, that modern art and fashion, I wouldn't say everything, but a segment of it has turned quite bizarre because there is… you can see a desperation to be different from somebody and doing something utterly crazy. But essentially modern art meant, modern art as a terminology came because Europe was the main place of art, that's how it is considered. Indian art was never considered art for whatever reason because here people wanted to depict life as it is. But European art was uh, clearly framed. If this means it belongs to this category, this means it belongs to this category, so artists felt suffocated by this European coldness of separation from one form of art to another. So some people broke those limitations and that was called modern art. So uh, I think it's better word is contemporary art, nothing modern about it. One thing we must understand if you are an artist, you should not believe you're creating something. Everything that can be created, is already created, we can only imitate. If you imitate well, you're a good artist. You believe you're creating something, that means you have not opened your eyes and looked at what's happening in nature. If you pay enough attention, just about everything that can be created is created. There are over… there are over one trillion creatures on this planet, varieties of creatures on this planet. If you look at one and the other, you can't believe with what purpose that kind of color, that kind of design and that kind of artistry has been done. If you pay enough attention, there is nothing to create. But we like to play the creator a little bit, so we can do it, but we should not believe we are creating something. We are just remix, we are doing a little bit. It's fine, it's human ingenuity, they want to do something. But this desperation to be different should go in art. It should be more an expression, a colorful expression of what may be in your mind or what you see around you, that's fine. As we come to an end of today's wonderful session with Sadhguru, at the outset, I'd like to thank the Department of Professional Studies for organizing this wonderful event. A huge round of applause to you guys on behalf of our class. But that boy from the political sciences, Let's put a volume, please. Thank you. I can be audible enough. Uh, am I audible enough? Yes. Yes.
Most human beings are always busy trying to weave philosophies to sustain their limitations. <clears throat> because you are not able to be ecstatic every moment of your life, then you will say, peace is the goal of life. When that is also not possible, you come to a philosophy, sadness, misery, anxiety, frustration, everything is part of life, we must go through all that. Let's look at it this way, do you ride a two-wheeler motorcycle? Huh? Then I hope you won't have ups and downs, ups and downs. You want to be up because the down consequence is different. Similarly with life, the down consequence is different. Only that, if you are among people who are always in those conditions, that they are up and down and up and down, you think you are normal. If you are riding with people who fall down every two minutes, if you are riding with toddlers who fall down off their little bicycle every two minutes or five minutes, you think it's normal. But if you are riding with somebody, I lived on a motorcycle but never really fell off, Maybe small spills but never really injuries and things, though I literally lived on a motorcycle at one time, I value that, that I was always up, never down. <laughs> but if you think up and down, up and down is good, by the time I was thirty-five, at least twelve or thirteen of my friends died on the roads, all motorcycling, wild riding. I didn't think down was a good thing. Whether it's physically or mentally, I never thought down is a good thing, you need a philosophy to support that. No, down is not a good thing, up is a good thing. Hello? <laughs> if you think you can learn only painfully, that's a sad way to learn. You can learn joyfully too <laughs> We are greatly privileged and blessed by your presence and all the more your inspirational discussions and conversations. This is the right time for the university being Golden Jubilee year. We are in the mission of your special transformating experience, youth and truth. Thank you very much and uh, our young people, this many represent ten percent of our student strength. We are from twenty-one thousand, I think two thousand one hundred are here. We are ever grateful to you. This will be a great learning and creating a new curve in the institution, Christ University. Thank you very much. I want all of you to understand uh, that you are sitting in an institution like this. For each one of you who is here in this country, there could be a million young people who are not able to be in an institution like this. So, it's very important that you make use of your time here in such a way that whatever you learn and acquire and what you make of you, out of yourself being here, in some way it is useful for everybody in this country and the rest of the world. Please make sure that your life is a significant life, it's very important you should not just pass as one more life. You must be a significant life because you have the privilege of uh, being in an institution where knowledge is available, many skills are available. There are a million children behind you who cannot get into a place like this.
please make sure everybody benefits from this education, your education must benefit everybody, not just you. Thank you very much.